we'll call it a political career, but I never had a career in, in, in politics. Well, I may have given advice here and there on a, uh, to, a, to a candidate here and there to somebody uh, elected. I certainly have engaged in, in um, presentations on policies and ideas and consulted on those things. I think that's different than a career in politics. Tony Katz. Tony Katz today. It's good to be with you. Find everything at TonyKatz.com. But early on in my, in my start, someone had utilized the expression that the right thinks the left, the political right, thinks the political left, left is wrong. The political left thinks the political right is evil. And to this day, that continues to be the case with more and more people on the right being more and more willing to say that the left is evil. But in the main, when we see a subject, it is a difference between I disagree and you have to do what we tell you to do. There is this desire from the political left that you will do what we tell you to do because we know what is best for you. And those things that you like and things that you enjoy, whether it's the idea of free speech or a free mind or even your gas stove are all up for debate, and if you should question them, why are you engaged in a culture war? Noah Rothman is a senior writer at National Review, author of The Rise of the New Puritans, Fighting Back Against the Progressives' War on Fun, and his latest piece, uh, making the cover of National Review, The War on Things That Work, which I think is a very, very... uh, App title and to me it was a bit of a takeoff on his work uh, in 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 New Puritans, and this idea that it's not just that everything that you do well you don't know how that's offensive you don't know how that that intersects with other things it's that everything you like, meaning this life of ours, that is all ill gotten and should be taken away you know to make things better. And you'll thank us later. Noah Rothman joins us right now. And before I get to uh, the, the the piece, uh, let's just take a look at this debt limit fight. Passing the House 314 in favor, 117 against, going uh, to the Senate. Uh, I would have been a no vote on this if I was a member of Congress, Noah Rothman. What say you on this deal? Well, it was designed so that you could be a no vote. Uh, it was crafted in such a way with the expectation that as long as McCarthy delivered the majority of his conference, most of whom are in safe districts, don't have to worry about primary challenges, don't have to worry about being reelected, could could vote for it. And because it had the imprimatur of Joe Biden's uh, presidency behind it, the expectation was that Democrats would not let it fall and sacrifice the head of their party and the uh, his blessing upon this deal. So that's all it needed. And that's why it got the majority of the House. And it will likely get, you know, maybe there'll probably be 25, 30 defectors in the Senate, which would be high. But it'll pass the Senate, too. That's how these deals are designed to work. They give you this cover. Leadership, if it's a good leader, gives you the cover to vote against this sort of thing with the expectation that it'll pass anyway. And that you won't have to really suffer the blame for it. Very few uh, defectors, with the exception, I guess, of Nancy Mace, given the reputation she's crafted for herself as a moderate, uh, really were risking anything by going against this, as long as it passed the rules, and it did pass the rules. And one of the things that makes McCarthy a very good speaker uh, is in this is in his speakership fight, he managed to provide a lot of what we understood to be the outsiders within his conference with power and gave them a buy-in into the success of the conference. So they're no longer just fixtures on television shows, rabble rousers on the street, on the the steps of Congress. They're institutionalists now. They're they're bought in. So Thomas Massey, who once described himself as the craziest SOB in the room, now has to vote for a rules package to raise the debt ceiling. So um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who uh, has a a penchant for saying controversial things on camera, has become one of leadership's most stalwart allies. By investing them in the success of the conference, he's tamed quite a lot of their animal instincts. 
You know, I, I followed Massey in his thoughts on this and was actually surprised that he was in favor of it as he also favored the penny plan uh, aspects of it, which are the part that, that I didn't, because the idea that if you don't pass the appropriations bills, we'll get a 1% reduction in all spending. I have not come to a place where I'm comfortable with a 1% reduction in military spend. And I think that people, like I spoke with uh, Senator Mike Braun about this, for example, all of a sudden, I'm a neo- Neocon, me? Me. I, I, I mean, I, I recoil at the thought. But the idea that we would take a look at today's society and say, this is a smart use, as opposed to a rational taking a look at all the things we spend on and realizing that you have to rank them. Some things matter and some things don't. I'm a neocon for being opposed to the penny plan? No, and I'm not comfortable with that either. Uh, look, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, which I absolutely support the Ukrainian independence and sovereignty and beating back the Russian menace in Europe, redounds to our national security benefit in ways that I think anybody who grew up during the Cold War understands intuitively. Um, but the shortage of ordnance that it has produced uh, is deeply troubling. And uh, we just got this report out of the Pentagon IG found that the transfer of some of our equipment from Kuwait, combat-ready equipment, uh, discovered that it wasn't combat ready. Really awful re- revelations like artillery shells that would explode if you fired them. Humvees that have dry rot on the tires. This is the sort of stuff that demands reform, not just throwing money at it. Something's going wrong here in the pipeline. But that was never going to be something you could do in a debt ceiling deal. Never. The fact that Republicans got what they got in this agreement is astounding considering the Democrats' position, which was initially... You get nothing, and you'll like it, not even a fee for the gaming license. We're not going to give you anything. Negotiating over this is wholly illegitimate. They had to back off that position entirely. Republicans got something. They weren't supposed to get anything. Anybody who looks at that as anything other than a, a, a victory for the, Dem- for the Republicans and a loss for Democrats is simply starting from a position of square one and not taking into account All the predicate for this, going back to February, January, even last year, when Democrats failed, refused to increase the debt ceiling with the understanding that the incoming House, one chamber of all of Washington, would uh, it would be beneficial for them to contrast themselves against the extremists in the House who couldn't pass anything. They're all wrong. I just want to I want everybody to enjoy how he snuck in a quote from Godfather two in there. That was Not even the fees for the gaming license. That bravo and well done. Noah Rothman joins us from National Review. Uh, Check out his book, The Rise of the New Puritans. Uh, That's available at Amazon.com, wherever fine books are sold. The piece over at National Review, The War on Things That Work. This is the political left dictating to America, we know what's best for you, we know what's good for you, we know what you really need. Everything that you have isn't something that you ever actually needed. As a matter of fact, it was an oppressive piece to somebody else. We're going to make things right. This is their argument. Well, with the exception of, with some rare exceptions, this is a story about the unaccountable fourth branch of governance, the um, the bureaucratic branch, the technocratic branch, which is very much captured by progressive um, social engineers who have convinced themselves of a couple of conceits. One of them is that climate change is an existential emergency and the minuscule uh, contributions that are made to it by things like small two-stroke engines and household furnaces are a uh, detrimental. And if we can clear that contribution that that it makes to global climate change, the more the better. And in the process, we've confused a lot of things that used to make sense and no longer do. Efficiency, the word efficiency, is no longer a term that describes an appliance that does a job well quickly. It is a term that describes an appliance that uses fewer inputs, gas, water, air, oil, what have you. And it doesn't necessarily have to do the job better. In fact, most of the times, it doesn't. So from your gas range, your gas-powered furnace, your uh, uh, AC, your dishwasher, your light bulb, your plastic bag, your plastic straw, who knows where it begins and ends? 
I only managed to, to touch on just a handful of some of the things that used to work and no longer do, or at least function less efficiently in terms that we understand efficiency to actually mean. It is contributing to what I describe in this piece as a campaign which, in individual measure, it just makes life a little bit more inconvenient or a little bit more expensive. But in the aggregate, it looks like a wholesale assault on the dignity of your personal choice and a campaign to impose upon you a lifestyle brand that progressives subscribe to because it doesn't in any way affect the kind of material and environmental benefits that they're sold as. All told, it looks like a crusade to make you into a progressive, whether you like it or not. The response to that argument is that, well, Noah, Um, We've gotten new data. Noah, we have more science. Noah, we have been able to study these things, and we can tell you definitively that if you use a gas stove and you have a four-year-old, your four-year-old is going to die, Noah. You will have a dead four-year-old. Is that what you want? Is that what you want, Noah? A dead four-year-old? Noah Rothman, if you don't have an electric car, your four-year-old is going to die. Don't you know that, Noah? This, I, I, I'm not too far well, off yeah, from where yeah. the argument is, but how does one counter the, well, we have new data, well, the science tells us, well, we've learned that when these things were happening, that, that these people were ill-informed, they weren't educated, as we often hear. How do you respond to that? Yeah, what you're describing is a campaign of a <clears throat> moral and emotional blackmail, and that has very little to do with uh, a data-driven analysis-driven uh, an, uh, approach to uh, reforms. First, uh, first of all, it is divorced from the political process, which would lend legitimacy to it. In part, they they don't engage in that because they are deeply insecure in their prescriptions. The science does not support these kind of interventions into private life. Uh, in the gas stoves case, in particular, the manipulation of the science in order to justify what is already sweeping the country at the state level. It was scuttled at the national level for now, um, but it's sweeping the country at the state level to um, uh, to banish from new construction gas hookups. And the studies were massaged. They were talking, you know, one of them was like, well, if you were to use a, a gas stove in a room where plastic bags are covering the windows and the doors, it could be harmful to your health. Yeah, you're kidding. Another was a study of studies, essentially a a synthesis of studies that was presented as though it that justified the idea that there was a meaningful rise in childhood asthma rates as a result of the use of gas stoves. And then conservative writers at the Washington Examiner hunted down one of the authors of this study who confessed that there was no correlation there, no established causation. And yet it was promoted as though there was established causation when it was promoted as that. But mostly what you encounter is what you described, a really flagrant campaign crusade to bludgeon you with uh, moral uh, quandaries to which any good person would, uh, would acquiesce. Because honestly, good people want this. And that's what you're confronted with once you beat back the idea that there are real environmental benefits to any of this, that there are real material benefits to your wallet or your quality of life. What you're left with is, well, you, you want to be a good person, don't you? Because it is a moral exercise. It is an exercise in a, in a personal approach to lifestyle that maybe you don't subscribe to, but you can't be allowed to not subscribe to it. Uh, and, and it is uh, it's an increasingly oppressive and ubiquitous campaign against just about everything that makes daily life a convenient enterprise. Talking to Noah Rothman of National Review, the war on things that work. Check out the article. It's the cover of National Review magazine. Find it at nationalreview.com. Just while we've got a couple minutes, go back to this idea of you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to have an, a, a disagreement or another point of view. But on that state level and on that local level, we've seen what New York has done uh, with the gas stoves and certain size buildings over the course of the next couple of years. We've seen the story out of Palo Alto where you had a celebrity chef who was opening a restaurant. Palo Alto changed the rules, no gas stoves. He said, if you don't let me have a gas stove, I can't open the restaurant. They changed the rules just for his restaurant. All the animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. People are often amazed by the progressive buy-in 
No one was talking about gas stoves, and the next thing you know, everybody's banning gas stoves. No mm-hmm. one was talking about position X, and the next thing you know, everybody's uh, on the left is down with position X. How does it move so quickly amongst them? I, I kind of wish I knew, honestly. It's a very bad pundit answer to say, I don't know. But it is a fascinating psychological phenomenon. So this piece was promoted by National Review over Memorial Day weekend, and it went insanely viral which was hilarious from my perspective because I'm grilling burgers and drinking beers and checking in on my phone and watching just the usual suspects in the progressive commentary at meltdown. Right. Like, have a great weekend, guys. Uh, but what I experienced there is, is a very familiar phenomenon at this point where often, even in the same sentence, the opponents of this sort of thing insist that it's not happening. It's all a figment of your imagination. You've invented all this. It's all culture warring. Your your um your myopia is getting the best of you. And also, it's really good that it's happening and it should be happening because this is very critical to environmentalism and, and the climate crisis is existential. In the same thought, and they don't recognize the incongruity of it. I don't think they're capable of recognizing the incongruity of it because the psychology demands that you have to be blinkered. You have to be crazy or stupid or both, and they have to be the rational ones. So even in their irrationality, they have convinced themselves that they are on the right side of the forces of science, Just to give moral theory of political economy. Let me give you a quick example of this. A guy by the name of Thor Benson, responding to the piece, wrote on Twitter, hyperbolic, hysterical, childish. God forbid some people call for changing the kinds of products we sell to help save us from a climate crisis. And your response was, it's not happening. And also, it's good that it's happening. That was that's the whole thing right there in a nutshell. I can't tell you how many times I wrote that sentence, those two sentences, because it was everywhere. It was constant. Just about every reply I got was it's not happening, and also it's good that it's happening. And they don't see how that, it doesn't, I suppose, uh, uh, destroy their own credibility, but it destroys the credibility of their argument, and it should, because it's not a factual statement. It's not an right. argument It's not an argument that appeals to anybody's logic. It's an emotional appeal. They are emotionally invested in this. And they're emotionally Noah Rothman is his wrong. name. Find his work over at National Review uh, and uh, The War on Things That Work. Check out the article, Noah. Thank you. I'm Tony Katz.